Jennifer Barber is a poet who comes from Brookline. She grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. She liked to play clapping and rhyming games with her friends as a child. She liked to jump and dance, play freeze tag, and pretend she was Nancy Drew. She said what brought her first to poetry was her stern first grade teacher who had the whole class write a poem about apple tree blossoms in the spring and it had to rhyme. And she liked it. It was good. And in second grade, her class had to memorize poems and she loved that too. And she said that she's been thinking about poems and poetry ever since. And since then, her poetry has appeared in a number of journals. She is the author of Given Away and Rigging the Wind, which was the winner of the core first book award in 2002. She's recipient of the Pushcart Prize and Heinrich Ball Cottage Residency in Ireland and a St. Botolf Grant and the Anna Davidson Rosenberg Award. She is founding and current editor of the literary journal Salamander, and she teaches literature and creative writing at Suffolk University. And Jennifer said what she's learned in teaching poetry is about getting students to relax and surprise themselves by going places they didn't expect to go in their writing. And she noted this often happens when they're given a writing exercise that has parameters, so they're encouraged to try something they might have not tried before and she finds that exciting. And last of all, I was also curious about one of her most uh, interesting, memorable moments in sharing poetry with community, as well as teacher. And Jennifer noted just back in, in March, she provided a program with some colleagues, uh, Fred Marchant and David Ferry, and others, and she said that uh, the panel was on odes, psalms, and praise songs, where they discussed poems, uh, that could be described in some way, their own poems, and also looking back on ancient Greek, Roman writings, biblical psalms, and contemporary praise songs or odes. And she said this was really fun. And uh, so there is a, a great open space of where Jennifer might take us this morning with her own poetry. And I look forward to going along on that journey with her and ask for you to please welcome her up here as she takes you on the journey as well. Please give a hand to Jennifer Barber. I'll read some poems from my new collection, Given Away. The first poem I'll read um, was written um, in Ashfield, Massachusetts. And I go there from time to time for a writing retreat. It's called Away. I count to 20 and back. The first day of the world, light slanting through the trees. Those cities have been built and destroyed and rebuilt, pollen and lamentation filling the air. Not here, quiet rains. A carpenter bee on the windowsill bent like a broken hinge, sleeping, or more likely, dead. Now and then, a moan escapes the sheep in the field behind the hill. Jewelweed, beloved of the hummingbird who seems a twig from here, a breeze in the gills of poplar leaves, a breeze, a twig, a beak, an eye past the old blast furnace, the wheel of August touches down. Uh, several of the poems in this book are about the experience of reading the Hebrew Bible. I come from an extremely secular background, um, but some years ago I started going to a class on the literature of the Bible. Um, and it's been a great experience because um, it really has put me in touch with some of the things that ancient peoples were thinking about, um, but also the connections that we can make with our own lives. Uh, but when I started taking the class, I, I just was very surprised at how much I fell in love with reading the Bible. 
This poem is called, It Wasn't Like Me. It wasn't. I guess it was. I guess I was at a loss. I guess I was letting the day turn over in the grass. I was in the grip of the rains, the thunder as messenger, cedars on the mountain drinking their fill, a breath, a hand's breadth, a breeze. Surprised by the coal on Isaiah's lips, under the sway of the psalm whose river rises to the singer's neck, a river he used to wade, the small trees glistening far off, I didn't know how to pull away. Uh, when it came out, I saw um, the Al Gore film, An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, it's caused me a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, this is called Walking I Pass, a gray house, a fence, a blue house with yellow flowers by the door. I can't get a breath of air. Heat gathers in the crown of an oak. The verse in Ezekiel where God says to pick up coals, scatter them over the city, sow the light of reckoning. I cross without looking. A driver hits the brakes hard. Around the corner, noon falls on a copper beach. It fires up each glossy leaf. Uh, there's a collection of rabbinic writings from 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD. And this was also uh, something we did in the class that I've been taking. So in this poem, there is a book mentioned, and that's the book I'm referring to. It's called the Pirke Avot, the Wisdom of the Fathers. To break it open, to make the orange lantern of the flower open, to wash my hands in its light. Last bees in the yard, the drowsy leaves leaking their slow red and gold. One of the sages in the book I read and misplaced said there was no time to finish the harvest, the day short, the night long, the master near. Uh, this is also uh, set in Western Massachusetts. Proximity. After the barn and yearling calves, a clabbered house, pink aquarelle to match the old hydrangea. Through a thin curtain, somebody visible upstairs, leaning over a bureau, maybe opening a drawer, sliding out a photograph. The ritual does nothing to dispel the eyes longing and the hands. Or the longing is mine, stubborn, irreducible, like the rooms of a house, secrets intact or not, late at night or first thing in the morning before I let the bedspread fall. I'm here three days, taking walks through town, the whole afternoon an anteroom for night. Across the road, a woman stirs a steaming mash for her sheep crowding the trough. Uh, the city of Lucena is in southern Spain. It has a long history. Um, before the first millennium, it was a center of Jewish learning and culture. Uh, then the fundamentalist Almohads um, invaded in the 12th century. And uh, later, um, it became a city in Spain um, after the Reconquista, so a Catholic city. Lucena. City the poets wept to leave. 
stronghold of the Almohads. Who fled when? The question baffles the swallows, scissoring the names Eliosana, Al-Yusana, Lucena. One hundred benedictions, five stray dogs, a bus station, a train station, churches, convent schools, wings of pages that rise from the Talmud like starlings to a tree. In a travel brochure, there is more to Lucena than furniture stores. It doesn't say which tiles painted red and gold send light along the paths, which gate opens onto which patio. A rabbi in 1148, we had to abandon her, the widow, all her splendor lost. If a dog trots out of town, if the too hot noon dries up and blows away, and I never sleep on a bed in Lucena, who will gather her sunflowers? Lucena, I am here waiting for rain, the rain behind the sun. Uh, the next poems that I'll read are um, translations that I did of the Spanish poet Emilio Prados. Um, his dates are 1899 to 1962. Uh, he was a contemporary and friend of Lorca's. And at the end of the Spanish Civil War, he had to leave the country and spent the rest of his life in exile in Mexico. Uh, the other thing um, to know about him was that um, he had a critical illness when he was very young, so uh, mortality is something that he thought about a lot. Um, so uh, these are a few different short poems of his that I've put together. Variations. Afternoon grew moist under a watery star. The day bent its reed. An hour fell into the sea. The foam of a wave gave birth to the dove. Gray sky, red dirt, red sky. A thrush flies from one olive tree to the next. Sunset, a toad made of cinders and gold. Tangled in an olive branch, the moon stays behind. I closed my door to the world, my flesh lost in sleep. I kept inside myself, magical, invisible, naked as a blind man. Lit from within, filled to the rims of my eyes. Trembling, unseen, I stayed there in the air, like clear water in a glass transparent angel in a mirror. Once I dreamt of sleep, another time of death, another of being alive. Now I believe that to dream is to sleep alive in death in order to forget its name. I have no rest. The one who might wake me isn't here. And the jasmine? next to the fountain, and the star with its aroma, and my heart in the dark. Lie still, moon, the night waits for you. Uh, this next poem is about um, reading all 150 of the Psalms uh, one summer and it's called Orchard. And I'll, I'll end with this. Opening the Psalms, letting in whole days between lying down in the shade of a valley and a path's steep climb. Opening to the Psalms that don't seem Psalms and the ones that do that send roots into the river like weeping overheard. 
The wrist of a psalm, a garment torn, the plowman's psalm, the warriors, the prisoners, the kings, the seeds of a psalm lost to us, lost in time on a hill of apricot trees, overlooking a city with its alleys, its gates opening to the psalms. The way folded paper flowers open from a shell, dropped in a glass of water, swaying, blossoming. Thank you very much. past reckoning the future now now is repaired here at the high mark where all waters rise before they start falling in the moment in front of your eyes dance through all time in a day lamb in the oven and cinnamon ginger and songs from your grandmother's heart Easter time, family gathers for dinner. Take your place till they're ready to start. Early this morning, out under the apple tree, falls drops a dapple in sun. Cidery air up to blossoms, cerulean. Grandfather's blessings begun. At a still point, there you yearn to stay, but the world turns. And it slips away Gone now the apple tree Long gone the family Raised in the home that they built in its place Ride to the strains of a loopy calliope Reaching for brass rings they no longer make But you're finding apple trees everywhere now Forest in new fall snow Gull above beech cliff towers in Tuscany Cradle them then let them go In the windlessness of the canyon floor Breathe the world down in And again before each 
tip of the paddle Each stroke of the pen God writing your name with his hand Thank you much. It's still public. Thin winter sunlight glints off stunted white tract houses straggling uphill from the rail yards. Sky of pale defeated blue rimmed with red like old men's eyes after a bad night. Twilight morning to evening dusk, trains rattle past outside the walls, leaving a wake of asthmatic steam behind. 4.30 and dawn an hour and a half away. Must you go? One lamplight fights a losing battle with the edges of the night. The cramped house shivers in the dirt-soaked dirt air. Nothing fits quite right. Corners not true. Foundations in doubt. A deadly chill creeps toward us through ill-matched joints, the building porous as our lives at this ungodly vulnerable hour of day. Stay a little longer. Do the minds own you or are you mine? The baby cried all night, plaintive voicing of our unmet needs. Love has about as much chance to bloom as the geraniums on the radiator. Both germinate from force of nature's habit. Probably a bad one, and want more nurturing than grit. There's grime on my spirit, too. The kitchen needs another coat of paint to cover the chill-bearing cracks. And I've got to make it from dark to dark again without you. Spend your day excavating future warmth. It will take more than another coat of anything to cover my chill-bearing cracks. Every conversation that counted happened in a car you were driving, speeding down some godforsaken lane, maps spread like an apron over your thighs, while I lounged feet on the dash, turning to watch your pale eyes on the road, your bald head, as my oldest now says, shining like a light. Does she mean a beacon? So it should have been no surprise to me last Saturday when, surrounded by our oldest friends and talking about the trip to Utah you had just returned from, you mentioned how maps had saved your life. I listened thinking how often you've disappeared for months at a time. Call, then don't call. Leave a message, you'll call again. I was always hurt, thought you'd left me, never <coughs> thought perhaps you'd lost your way. Dear Will, what a long way it is from Cascade, Iowa, 1953, one stifling night when your father, had he strapped you again, smothered you on a couch with kisses till you managed to squirm away. Under your bed upstairs, you had already started your calculations on school paper, each eight by 11 inch sheet lined with streets of your invented village, the footbridge, the delicate mountain range, and of course, the highway. At night, while your family knit up their dreams in the next room, you took those sheets and pieced them together on the floor. You knew there was something somewhere else to go. You had the map to prove it. Saturday after Memorial Day. Summer finally shows its bright face after a long, cool, wet spring. And I find that I do want, want to open the windows of winter, the storm casements of New England cold, but rather huddle in the dark old mansion, actually afraid of the West Nile virus and the persistent rumble of the nylon wheels on the concrete expressway, which goes nowhere for me. In fact, always leads to nightmares and never the fantasies that everyone else seems to find at the end of their ever-circling labyrinth without a center. I mourn my friends, the numerous crows, my totem symbols, who have been transformed 
into the carriers of the virus from Egypt and look to see if they are dropping over from the encephalitis, which the TV assures me threatens the elderly and the very young. Meanwhile, the deer ticks, which I pick so assiduously off my ankles when I cut the lawn down in Delaware, have made their way over the years up the coast of Massachusetts, and I wonder if they have penetrated the desert of Boston as I'm manhandled by the jarring power of my landlord's two-wheeled tractor, which pulls me about the huge lard. He is no longer capable of mowing himself, especially since the wealth spring has sprouted a lawn already knee-high and gone to seed. The greatest prosperity of my adult life filled the city's homeless system 20% past capacity. And the inn where I work had over 100 people living in the lobby all through the warm, damp cough of the winter. For me, it was a flashback to the winters of 87 and 88 when the Reagan budget cuts and the downsizing of old industrial America last overwhelmed the end and caused the formation of the current homeless system. My brother, just laid off after 18 years, two years short of a pension, training workers around the planet to run the computer systems of Coca-Cola, assures me that I just don't understand that things are really getting better. But I know that, at best, this is just the eye of the storm, and that what we went through for the last 30 years will be followed by the other side of a storm whose tidal surge has only just begun to hit. and pear, apricot, then this.